guys, it's time for an NBA game two preview. We're going to break down Monday's game two matchups in the NBA playoffs. But before we get to that, we got to look back on the weekend and name our super fantasy player of the week presented by Supercuts. Now, despite the loss, we got to give it to Kyrie Irving, who went for 65.75 DraftKings fantasy points in Boston on Sunday. He put up 39 points. Five rebounds, six assists, and four steals. He was the highest scoring player on either Saturday or Sunday slate this weekend. He's gonna, he cost you 10200 to roster. So now I got to ask the panel, you guys, on tonight's three-game slate, who's worth paying up for? I, like Nick, who's going to put up those Kyrie numbers? Yeah, I know James Harden had himself a big game over the weekend as well, and he's not going to cost you as much as Kyrie did on Sunday. Um, but the guy that I like most right now is Donovan Mitchell um, at 8.1K. Of course, he's the only guy in that range, of course, with a smaller slate. Uh, but the big thing for me is he put up similar numbers in terms of fantasy production to Harden, and he was $1,000 cheaper, $1,000 DK dollars cheaper. Um, so you're going to be able to save with this guy. The big thing for me is he's going to get a ton of shots up there. This Mavericks team, I know we're going to talk about him a little more as we go along, but they just don't belong without Luka Doncic. They wouldn't, I don't think they would be here without Luka Doncic as much as it was only what a five point game, six point game last time out. Uh, so I don't have a ton of respect for them right now. And Donovan Mitchell, maybe he's not going to get you as much in the way of rebounds or, the, or assists, but he's going to get a ton of shots up. And I think it's going to make a big difference for him going against a team that just can't hang with the Jazz right now. All right, Matt, who's worth paying up for tonight on this slate? So I'm going to mirror some of what Nick is saying and take Rudy Gobert. I, I feel the same about the Mavericks. If this is an offense that shouldn't be that good, and I think the rebounds will be there for Gobert. He had 17 of them last game. The block shots will be there. He had three of those. But he only took one field goal attempt and had five points all coming from the foul line. I think that the offense picks up for Gobert. Like The game was too close for Utah. I think that he probably mixed some things up going forward. And this is also a slate where Jokic is playing and Embiid's playing. Those will be the focus, the the two main focuses at center. And Gobert just gets overlooked as a result of that because Jokic is amazing and Embiid's amazing. They're playing bigger minutes in the playoffs. But Rudy Gobert is as well. And I think the week game one might mean that people overlook him for game two. All right, so we know who you're going to pay up for, but you got to find some value here too. So uh, who's a value play that you have your eye on for tonight, Matt? So we have to look to the Toronto Raptors because they have a bunch of injuries from over the weekend against the Sixers where they lost Gary Trent and Scotty Barnes and Thaddeus Young. And the guy who benefits the most there is probably Chris Boucher at 4,400. And this could be a chalky play, but I'm actually not convinced that it is because Boucher didn't do well in his limited playing time in game one. And I think people might be a little scared off of this. Like maybe you just want to play Fred Van Vliet and Pascal Siakam who have to do more for this team with some of these other key guys out. Um, so Boucher does scare some people at times. Like he's had a lot of really bad fantasy games over the course of the season, but that upside is there too. And I think like if he has one of his big games and you don't have him at 4,400, you basically have no chance. So the range of outcomes is wide, but I think Boucher has to play big minutes. This Raptors team is just too shorthanded and, he is one of the guys who can space the court on a team where all of a sudden a lot of their playmaking is gone. All right, Nick, who's the value play that you have your eye on? I think Matt made some great points about Chris Boucher, definitely a guy who I was considering as my favorite play. Uh, OG Ananobi, of course, is another guy too. 5.8K going up against the Sixers in this one. He gets the second biggest usage bump on the team with no Trent or Scotty Barnes on the floor this season and puts up like 1.08 DK fantasy points per minute in those scenarios. But my favorite one is actually the guy who got booted in the first round, DeMarcus Cousins, or first, uh, first game that is DeMarcus Cousins at 3.6K. Only played 10 minutes um, and almost provided five times that fantasy value. Got 15 DK fantasy points um so not far off from that and i know he's played you know mixed amount of minutes over the course of the season this is a guy of, but who's is going to save you a ton of money if you can go and get him and against the warriors like he's done pretty well i think he's provided a, right around five times value each each of the i think three of the four times that he's seen him not counting the other night um on limited minutes so this is a guy who you know can make the most of his time against the warriors he's done it multiple times now all right, let's go over to the sports book now, fellas. Uh, so the Sixers easily handled the Raptors in game one of their series, beating them by 20. That's right, two zero points. Uh, Toronto going to be seven and a half point underdog heading into tonight's action. Like Nick, any chance you expect this one to be a little closer here? 
Yeah, this one I, I think should be a lot closer. I know you're losing some key pieces, of course, in Scotty Barnes. We've talked about a little bit already, but when this is a well-coached Raptors team, uh, of course, that's why the Lakers are trying to poach them. Uh, you know, it was, uh, there's a while and a whole other thing. Um, but the other thing for me is like Tobias Harris. You know, he's a good player and everything, and as a number three, he's a much better, much more valuable asset to any team, um, or even number four in this case with Tyrese Maxey. But I look at those two guys, and as impressive as their first outing was against the Raptors, I just don't think that to, to ask them to replicate what they did last time out is a little bit much do I still think the Sixers will win this game but there's no way that the Raptors are going to get blown out twice like this in the first two games Matt do you agree that game one was an anomaly yeah even with the injuries I do think this game has to be closer like there's no way that it makes sense to expect another blowout just because the Raptors are a good team the motivation will be there not to fall 2-0 in the series but at the same time I don't really know. Like, this is a little bit of a confusing game for me. I don't know that I'd take Toronto at plus seven and a half. Um, I think that that number is probably just pretty accurate and the game probably comes in around there. But Toronto does have a chance to keep this game pretty close. Like, there are competent bench players here. And then the other thing is Nick Nurse is not scared to play Pascal Siakam and Fred Van Vliet big minutes. And I would honestly not be shocked if both of them play 45 plus minutes tonight. Like this is a very important game to keep the series within a reasonable margin at one, one instead of two, nothing. So I think they really go all out to try to win this one. I think the stars play big minutes. And for that reason, I don't expect Philly to have another blowout. I think the Raptors really need this one to keep the series alive. All right. So Matt, uh, Utah took down the Lucas Mavericks in game one on Saturday. John Chich still nursing that left calf strain. Uh, so if he can't go in game two, do you expect Utah to take both games in Dallas? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I don't think that Utah is necessarily a good bet here at minus five, but I do expect them to win the game. I mean, Dallas just loses so much offense without Luka Doncic. And I think the Jazz in general are just an underrated team. Um, I've said this a bunch of times recently, but they had these collapses at the end of the regular season where they blew big leads and ended up losing. And I think that everyone just kind of dislikes the jazz at this point. Um, I'm actually interested in the jazz to potentially upset the suns next round. You can get them plus 700 to win the Western conference. I think the suns are the better team, but I think the jazz are close enough that an upset is a legitimate possibility. So maybe it's wrong of me to just look past the Mavericks, but I really don't think that Dallas stands much of its chance unless they get Luka Doncic back for game three and four. Yeah, Nick, are you already on to the next one here? Yeah, I am. And I actually do think that they'll cover this one tonight. I know it was a similar spread in game one. I just, like like Matt said, the, the Mavericks don't have the offensive firepower without Luka Doncic. And as much as they do have you know strengths on the defensive end, this is a, a, a Jazz team that – I don't think is going to go and pull off some upset, you know, it'd be like against the Suns or anything necessarily, but they are a strong offensive team. One of the better teams in terms of offensive ratings throughout the course of the regular season. I know that only means so much when we get to the postseason, but going up against a team like the Mavericks who don't have their best guy and is the person that by and large carries them to the postseason, you just, you're not going to be able to hang with something like that when you're a more complete team and you had your two best guys. All right. So from one injured star to one that returned, uh, Steph Curry was back in the lineup for the Warriors in game one against the Nuggets. He played 22 minutes off the bench. Uh, he had 16 points, but it was Jordan Poole who stole the show. He had 30 in his playoff debut. Pretty nice. Uh, the Warriors are big favorites in game two. So Nick, do you expect them to roll once again and cover the spread here? Yeah, and this is another seven-point spread, but yeah, I do I do expect them to cover in this one. Um, I understand that, you know, Nikola Jokic, we talk about him from a fantasy perspective all the time, and he's, again, another star carrying your team to the postseason and whatever success you have because no Jamal Murray. But again, no Jamal Murray. It's been like that all year. Um, and I think with Steph Curry not even getting his full allotment of minutes and shots and everything, how do you not respect that coming into this game where even if he gets, like, still a fraction of that, you know, maybe increased volume, but a fraction of that, I don't know how the Warriors are going to go and hang with that um, because they showed they couldn't do it before. Do I think Jordan Poole's going to do what he did again? Not necessarily, but I don't think he's going to have to because Steph's going to get more opportunities. All right, Matt, do you agree? I think this is the first answer where Nick and I are on opposite sides. Although the point he just raised at the end there is kind of where I'm looking to. I'm just drawing a different conclusion from it. So I don't think Jordan Poole can repeat what he did in game one. And I also don't see Steph Curry's minutes ramping up too much. So you could kind of spin this both ways. Like he played in the low twenties, but he did miss a couple minutes at the end there for the blowout. And if the game were closer, he might've played 24 or 25 minutes instead of the 21 to 22 that he got. But at the same time, I don't see Steph Curry getting above 30 minutes yet. Like they're being a little cautious with him and we probably see mid to high twenties now, not 30 plus yet. 
which means more Jordan Poole. And as good as he is, he's not Steph Curry. And I think that that distinction where Curry gets 10 less minutes than he might get if this game were a month from now, I think that that is enough for Denver to keep it close. And Nikola Jokic is still the best player on the floor. Um, He did not play great in game one. I think he'll be able to bounce back and have a better game too. So I'm leaning Denver. I don't think they win or anything, but I do think they can cover the spread.